currently sitting down with the incredible Aaron Mitchell from House of the Moon and Nation Unsevered. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today and telling us all about the terrible crisis that is murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, and also ways on um, how to become a better ally to Native Americans. We greatly appreciate that. And also thank you to everyone that has tuned in from their busy schedules. We greatly appreciate that as well. Uh, my name is Heather Martz Keller. I am the Marketing Associate here at DTC. And for those of you who may not know what DTC is, we are an IT company, specifically a managed services provider for multiple clients in multiple sectors. And just to give you a brief background on our webinar series, this year we are focusing on the theme creating connections. So our main goal here with this series is to be able to be a resource for all. Um, we really want to focus our, our sites on creating and maintaining these connections all throughout the year. So we are definitely exploring new ways and different ways and able to do that. And this month being our first Did You Know? So be sure to follow along with DTC on all of our social platforms to see what exciting topic we will be covering next. And again, I would just would like to thank Erin Mitchell for joining us today. Um, she is the founder and executive director of Nation Unsevered, as well as founding counsel to House of the Moon. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Erin. So without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much, Heather, for having me today. I love that DTC is doing this. Um, because I think that we are often so siloed and sometimes what we do in our work and, and even in our, um, you know, private lives. And I think that we're realizing that we're as companies, as professionals, as individuals, we are dynamic people that have interests in so many different arenas and that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And, um, and I think that DTC and this webinar series really, um, sounds that off, you know, and really makes that very clear and apparent for people. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just letting everyone know all of our contact information will be in the beginning of these slides and it is also presented here. Should anyone want to reach out to Aaron, myself, or um, the creative marketing director here at DTC, Victoria Dota. So Erin, how did you get here? So yeah, I am actually a Chinese herbalist and an acupuncturist um, by trade. And I, you know, um, during the kind of mid 2015, um, 16, I uh, wanted to do a little bit more research on our nation's founding because I felt a divide starting to happen within our country. And I, I grew up um, with a father and a mom who were really into politics and really into social justice work. And um, and so I, I didn't know a whole lot. I studied civil rights um, in school and in, and in college, but I didn't really know a whole lot about our nation's founding, except the little bit that we get in school. Yeah. And I knew, you know, I knew there was, I knew there, you know, there was information about how that there was a, a genocide here um, on this land. But again, it seemed like American history skimmed over it a little bit. And I just wanted to know more. So I went on an American history tour um, in the West, taught through the lens of Native American leaders. And it was in the sacred lands of, um, uh, of the Black Hills in South Dakota and some territory in Wyoming as well. And so I went there and I learned our American history through their, through Native American lenses and um, through their eyes. And I just got completely blown away because um, there were so many things that I had no idea about. And um, it really affected me in a big way. And, um, one of the big things that I might, you know, go into further in today's presentation is just how, um, is how to us as Americans, you know, history is so recent, mm -hmm. um, you know, 1776, right. It's not that, it's not that long of a history compared to the rest of the world. And so, um, so, 
through the lens of Native Americans, I learned that history is very much the present day for them. And so one of the things I learned about was a contemporary crisis called Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. And there's actually an acronym for it. That's how common it is and and awful it is in the community. So it's M-M-I-W-G. And um, and it's a very present day crisis born out of our his our nation's history. So I learned about that, and um, in that moment, just just even the phrase is really hard to, yeah. s- to say to swallow um, to not kind of let it just pass over. You know. Um, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. And then when, when you start to understand the statistics and the numbers, um, that becomes even more difficult to say, let alone realize that there's very real human beings and faces and names and ages and lives, life stories to the, to this acronym. Yeah. Yeah. And Erin, I think that makes a very good point and flows nicely into our next slide. What is Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls? So um, it it refers to a human rights crisis um, that's only in the last less than a decade, maybe a decade, uh, been more of conversation in national media. Mm-hmm. Although, um, you know, there are indigenous women and leaders and organizations and elders and ancestors that have been fighting this for generations. Um, but because the Department of Justice uh, just in the last five or six years has done uh, data and basically done um they have used data to count the number of missing and murdered that 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 it kind of it it ended up coming into mainstream because you know at like anything especially in our modern day when we have data we we tend to understand the scope and the depth of an issue for sure but, you know and before that i don't think it was it was understood or counted basically because of some of the reasons why it exists, you know, um, one of the reasons why there was no count of murdered and missing indigenous women and girls is because on coroner, on coroner reports there, um, there's, you know, Caucasian, um, African American, Asian, um, Hispanic and other, and so they're literally categorized on coroner reports and state um, when you're, you know, when you're doing, um, when you're checking off, you know, the reason by why somebody has died, uh, they're checked off as other. So you think about that. And that's, that's just another yeah. horrible, horrible piece of information I hate to bring to you this morning or this afternoon on the East Coast, but, um, but it's true. So now we can go into some did you know facts. Yeah. Um, So I love your did you know series because, you know, if you don't know, you can't care. If you don't care, you can't change anything. And so, um, and did you know, you know, I feel like I didn't know. And I, and then when I did my, my whole life change, my whole trajectory of was doing. I no longer practice acupuncture. I no longer practice Chinese medicine. Um, I live in a different town now so that I can be more, um, you know, close to the women that I am working with. And um, so, yeah, so basically um, there, there's a, there's, there's some things I'd love to say, uh, you know, number one is um, one of the one of the Department of Justice data points that I was speaking about earlier was that in 2016, when they did a count, there were 5,712 women who were murdered or went missing, indigenous women and girls. And so what, what blew my mind away with that number 
was knowing that it was more than our the entire um, fatality rate in the U.S. Iraq War. That was a 15 year war and running. And these are service people who sign up to die. You know, yeah. like it's a conscious choice. And so, in one year, there were more women and girls that went murdered or missing of this demographic in the United States. That does not include the number in Canada. And um, the the data points are different in Canada. However, there are comparable numbers in each situation, whether you're talking about missing and murdered, um, you're talking about death, uh, death rates, um, murder rates, excuse me, or um, like human trafficking or kidnapping in the missing arena. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's just an astonishing number and it's an astonishing um, comparison, you know, with our, with our servicemen and women. Also, um, you know, if you ask a child or an adult about a name of famous indigenous woman, you'll probably hear Pocahontas or Sacagawea. Mm -hmm. Sacagawea is on the coin up there. Um, Randy L. Teton is actually one of our advisors in House of the Moon, and she was the woman who was asked to be the face of Sacagawea when the Smithsonian Institute decided to create this um, commemorative coin. And um, so both po Pocahontas and Sacagawea are a MMIWG victim. And why that is, is because they were, they were children and they were traded or won in dice games. Um, they, have, they both have unique stories, but mm -hmm. they were, um, you know, 12 and 13 years old. And um, so this story of of them at falling in love with, you know, a white man um, is not true. And yet that's kind of the, the misnomer and the fantasy that most Americans have about yeah. our indigenous women and girls. And so that's a really important point to bring up. And then just, you know, kind of, um, Elaborating further is that 86% of sex crimes committed against indigenous women are perpetrated by non-natives. So I think there's also this idea that, oh, okay, well, indigenous communities, reservations, they're filled with crime, they're filled with poverty. Um, you know, native men are somehow, you know, because of their addictions or because of their issues, are perpetrating these these crimes against their women. And there's a lot, then there is a lot of domestic violence issues. Don't get me wrong. Um, but that is like, you know, getting back to walking and chewing gum at the same time. Like, yes, you can have issues within the communities that are indigenous on indigenous. But the, the fact is from the Department of Justice, uh, 86%. That's a really high percentage yeah. being committed by non-natives. Um, and then I, I would just say too, in terms of did you know, is that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, after a big report that was done in Canada um, called the, um, it, it was basically a report that interviewed over 200 families who, who had a, a daughter or a mother or a family member go missing or murdered. And it was called the National Inquiry. And so it was interviewing these families. What went wrong? What, how did this happen? What do you know? What, you know, what do we need to do to change this? There were 213 recommendations made by those families um, collectively. Mm -hmm. And not one has been implemented in Canada, um, I guess the last, so it was finished in 2019. So we're two years out and not one has been implemented. However, Justin Trudeau, after reading the report, after seeing the data that was collected, which was beyond the recommendations that were made, he called it a genocide. That was how high the numbers and the statistics were. 
So the United States is is far behind on that realm. We have not gone to that level of investigation into this. Um, however, like I said, there are correlating um, numbers and there are correlating issues. And so we can look to we can look to what was done in Canada for information, just like they can look to us for certain legislation that's been passed or things like that. So we have we have to you know we have to see this as as the global pandemic that it is. So can you tell us a little bit more about why this is happening at such an alarming rate? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so essentially the, you know, the reason why major crimes can be committed by non-natives on reservation lands at such high rates is, you know, is because they're, they are, laws are set up so that tribal law enforcement cannot arrest or prosecute a non-native on in, on reservation lands. So you might have a suspect, you know, that has been identified, a woman or a, somebody might call the tribal police, say that so-and-so has been seen you know, he was already reported for this crime or this misdemeanor, whatever. And, and if it is, um, if it is related to a major crime, which a major crime is kidnapping, rape, murder, these are major crimes that are basically need to be dealt with by federal, by federal agents. Mm -hmm. Um, Federal agents are very, there's usually only one, maybe two that are assigned to reservation lands. Reservation lands are, you know, huge swaths of land. So it's very difficult. Like it might take days to get to even a crime scene if they even came out, if they were called. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so these are reason, these are some of the reasons why these these are happening at really high rates. So then there's jurisdictional complications. So there's state and federal, um, depending on where a crime is thought to have happened or where an incident is thought to have happened. It basically just becomes this, you know, um, confusion and who, you know, who's dealing with this. I mean, we all know in our, even in our workplace, when there's a problem, you know, it's like, was oh, HR dealing with this or is the yeah. CEO, oh my God, do we need to get the P, you know, like we, we have to figure out, oh, who's, who's dealing with this? Well, it's unfortunately it's happening for something as tragic and as, you know, and as awful as this. So somebody's been kidnapped, a young girl, and all of a sudden people are passing the ball back and forth. Whose problem is this? Yeah. So, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but that's some of the issues. Um, another huge issue that I think was a big, you know, smack in the face for me back when I went out to do the tour was this connection between extractive industry and murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. And, and the reason for that is extractive industry, usually they have man camps that travel to do the work that's being done in these very remote places where natural gas and oil is extracted. Mm -hmm. And so those man camps, they are basically, you know, you know, migrant workers. Um, They are not screened for previous criminal records or sex offenses. And then they set up in these territories that are either on reservation lands or very close to, because that's where the extractive industries are going to mine. And so they drive a market for the sex trade. And, um, and then they know now that they can pretty much commit crimes with impunity. So it, that is one of the most shocking facts for me. Um, when I heard about it really, you know, just turned my stomach beyond belief because, um, because there, there's some sort of culpability there where, you know, we're, we're all, 
this this industry is part of our society. It's part of how we operate, and yet look at how uh, how it's being done. You know, yeah. and, and and who's in charge of of the the way that that's happening, and who is um, who is subject to the worst possible situations because of the way the corp the way the corporate industry sector is set up. So um, that that's a huge that's a huge drive to this MMIWG issue. And um, in terms of their buyers, so when it when it comes to the man camps, um, the criminals that are I'm not saying that every migrant worker in a man camp is a sex offender, but it does draw this very high tendency for that. Mm -hmm. They are migrant. They don't necessarily have families that they need to be home for. Um, and so they are a, what, what the sex trade industry calls a buyer. Um, a seller is the next thing that I'll talk about, which is, of the alarming rate would be, you know, could be gangs um, that infiltrate reservation lands because of the poverty, because again, there's not a lot of, there's not going to be a lot of, of obstacles for them to work through. So they can infiltrate to sell methamphetamine, to sell women and girls, and um, to kidnap them and sell them to these buyers. And uh, this has been proven. This is they're they're tracking these these flows of women and girls and where they come from and they and where they're going to. And they're they are they are in the the highest rates of these are in regions where huge extractive industries are taking place. So this is a this is an absolute fact and an undeniable connection that we cannot look away from anymore. Yeah, I can definitely say just from an outsider and getting to know more about the work that you've been doing that House of the Moon has been doing um, out of all of the statistics that I know you have said to me, I know in the very beginning when you said that basically U.S. citizens and these migrant workers can essentially go onto these reservation, these tribal lands and essentially come out completely unscathed by the U.S. government. I think that's what kind of like push, push me back a little bit. I'm like, that's not OK. What do you, what do you mean they nothing happens. Um, so I'm very glad that you bring up that point because that's where it kind of got me. And there absolutely, I agreed that there needs to be change among so many levels, but that one particularly because the flow of it just isn't adding up, doesn't make sense kind of thing. And yeah, so thank you for bringing up that point. Yes. Yes. I, I feel you. That was the shock that was the moment of change for me. That was the moment where I said, mm, no, yeah, that, that, you know, I, I can't go back and say, oh, the world is a troubled place and I'm going to try to do as much good as I can. But wow, that's, you know, that's a terrible tragedy and, and move on. That was the point where I was like, oh, no, that yeah. I can't I can't let that one slide, you know. Which goes perfectly into the next one as well, the shock response. Can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I think that, oh my goodness, you know, I mean, look at our, you know, the way we take in news and how many of us have started to turn it off and if they haven't already and some people don't ever even watch it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, <laughs> I had a friend that called the local news the body bag show for many, many years. And, you know, so there's a level of numbness that can come over us when we're talking about tragedies, when we're talking about painful topics, when we're talking about um, things that really hurt people, hurt children, hurt the world. I think we've all had so much of it in our lives because of media, because of television and now social media that, that, that has spread. Yeah. 
at a rampant level. And we only have our stomachs are only so big. And, when, you know, when we talk about digesting information. Um, you if you learn something, you actually do have to digest it, you have to take it in, you have to process it, you have to let go of what you can't deal with. And you have to, you know, plug into the brain or your, you know, your analytical intellectual mind, you, have, you know, okay, what can I do about this that I care about, you know, so there is a process of digestion. And I think when it comes to real tragic issues like poverty or like hunger, child, you know, child hunger, uh, homelessness, um, rape, murder, the things that we're sharing today with MMIWG, there, there could be the tendency to say, that doesn't make that that cannot be, mm-hmm. you know, this um, it's a mistake. That's impossible. Or oof, that you know, that's just that's too TMI. Too much information. I can't deal with that. I have kids to get to school. I already have this these many problems in my life. This is so unrelated to me. Mm-hmm. These are these are kind of the human responses, and I know because I am I'm one of them, and I I I mean. I, I've had all these responses to so many different things in my life. And, um, so I think, I think with this one, it, it was, uh, all those things I think have influenced me, the things that I care about, you know, the things that I let into my digestive system, um, either before social media or during, um, but at the same time, I, this particular one entered and, and my process was really, was really unique because it, it ended up shifting things. And again, it goes back to what you were saying on the last, uh, just a few minutes ago is the thought of my father or my sister calling the police in our County that I grew up in to say that I've gone missing or to say that they found me dead and half naked in a ditch and they basically passed the ball. And so, so I think there was a little bit of a really, you know, as a woman and as I'm not a mother, um, in that way, I'm not a mother, I don't have children, but I have nieces and nephews. I mean, there was something so visceral for me that felt like that I could relate to that. I yeah. couldn't wait to that response. And so even though it's shocking to hear what keeps you in that digestive process of what, you know, what do you learn about that's really tragic and awful, but has you, has it inspire you and has it move you to take effective action? And I think that that is really, um, shock responses are totally real and totally fair and everybody has them. And at the same time, what keeps you from shock, from going from shock to doing something that you can versus shock to denial Mm -hmm. or shock to, you know, sweeping it under the rug. Yeah. So how can one become a good ally? Yeah, so this is this is a really critical issue, especially when it comes to indigenous communities or any minority communities that you're working with. There's so much to be said about this slide. Um, I'll try to try to I try to make it simple and 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 bring out the most important points that I've learned along the way. Um, one of one of the biggest things is we have this culture of solutions and culture of act like active solutions. So, Oh, well, this is how you're going to solve. We're, we're problem solvers. We're, we're born into a culture of problem solvers. It's a way more masculine way of being, you know, Mm -hmm. let's get to the problem. Let's solve it. You know, this is, this is who our leaders are. This is in terms of in business and, Um, sometimes in government or historically more in government um, and, and corporations. And so what, what's happening here is you can't, you don't go in and 
You don't go in and tell anyone in this situation what the problem is and how to solve it. You have to be a really good listener, like the rabbit with the gigantic ears here. You have to really tune in. You have to be willing to not have answers. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be willing to hear what the people who are experiencing the tragedies have to say about it. And it requires an enormous amount of patience and humility and really taking what any, any kind of process that you've learned in terms of how to deal with issues or problem solve and, and really putting it aside. And may, you may pick up something, but you may never pick up anything that you've been taught on how to deal with something. This is a totally new approach. At least it was for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, part of, part of how to be a good ally is just to be a good listener. And, um, and so it's going into the communities and saying, wow, I heard, I heard about this, you know, and this is kind of how I got started. I heard about the issue. And then my next response was, how can I help? And so for the first several years, through my work with Nation Unsevered, I was only advocating for and raising funds for indigenous-led projects that dealt with this issue. So it was leaders in the community that they had already come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. They had already come up with strategies. They already knew what needed to be done, both on a legislative side and also in, on a community side. Um, and they knew where they were in that process, the, at least the ones who I met. And so that was how, how I started to get involved, you know, it was basically just saying, here I am, I'm willing, I want to devote time, energy, resources to this, you know, how, how, how would you like me to fit in here? Mm -hmm. And that was, that was how um, I was able to, to be involved initially. So we have briefly mentioned the name, but what exactly is House of the Moon? Yeah, so House of the Moon, um, again, it was, it was a, it was, it came from my work with Nation Unsevered. And I started to meet a lot of Indigenous leaders on that, uh, with my work in, in that organization. And it was conversations where, um, what if, what if there was, what if, what if the women take this into, you know, what if we as the, as women take this on, you know, it's so, it's, it's so awful to feel that, you know, drug cartels, uh, the oil and gas industry, yeah, the archaic government laws and jurisdictional paralysis issues with law enforcement poverty. I mean, you want to think about like the biggest monsters out there to deal with. So is what, what if we just go to the heart of the people who it's happening to, which is the women and see what can we do for them? And so, um, but when I was meeting with the women on the founding council, they were, they were already having that, dis they've been having that discussion and they have been doing those things on a local level. Um, there, you know, like each of them had their own. So for example, one of the founding council members, Melissa Moses, she, she teach, she went and got her, uh, her, you know, certification in, in Muay Thai boxing in Asia to come back to her community to teach only self-defense to the women in the community. That is so amazing. Yes. And she also, I just have to mention, she also got her diver's license because as a child, she's been exposed to MMIWG so much that she wants to be a part of search and rescues for bodies that are found in the water. I mean, this oh, is, wow. you want to think about 
how you decided to be do what you do in your life. This is an indigenous woman who's doing that. So she's doing that. You know, um, Chief Chief Judy Wilson. She's doing so much for for the environment, for water protection in her community, for so many other things like um, through. You know, obviously to advocate to end murder to missing. And, um, she has, she has stopped pipelines from going through, um, in certain areas in British Columbia, you know, these are to, to avoid the man camps. Right. Yeah. So, um, so everybody here is doing everything like they're doing it. And, and there's so many more leaders that aren't listed here that are part of the advisors. And then people that I've met that are doing things that aren't necessarily on the advisor um, or council, the advisor circle or the council, but nonetheless, everybody in their own communities is doing something. I think me as an outsider, what I got to see was there were all these efforts that were, you know, they're fighting the big monster and they're on their own. They're on their own tribe or they're on their own first nation and they're doing all of this work for that tribe or first nation. And yet it's happening on all of them, not all of them, a lot of them. And so, Hmm, you know, that was curious too. like, wonder how we could come together here. Yeah. That is absolutely amazing that you guys brought together so many different skill sets and that it just keeps growing and branching out into all these different sectors while fighting for the same cause. Yeah. So, yeah. So to continue with what is House of the Moon is it's an empowerment and self-defense training program designed for indigenous women. It's a holistic approach uh, or the four directions. It's mental, emotional, physical and spiritual empowerment and self-defense. So like I just said to you about Melissa Moses, who taught physical self-defense, uh, that's just one component of this training. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more, uh, as you might know, as a woman and maybe some of the listeners, there's a lot more to self-defense than just being able to knock somebody out. You know, you have to feel, you have to feel confident. You have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to have a strong spirit. If you're feeling low and vulnerable emotionally, you know, even if you're just walking to your car, that could be a day where something bad might happen. You know, you mm -hmm. have to constantly have this holistic approach to uh, your self-esteem, your confidence, your self-worth. These are all things that affect how you hold yourself and what you will accept or not accept. And yes, there will always be accidents. There will always be, you know, horrific criminals that, that, um, that's go, you know, that, that, that doesn't matter to, but you can do a lot of prevention with some of those levels of empowerment and self-defense. And so the, um, so what they do is they take this training course, house of the moon training, and they become, they learn, they learn all of this type of curricula that we're talking about. It's rooted in traditional values and ways. So it's taught by indigenous leaders in the community and, and it's taught through a traditional lens. So again, it's the community is doing the work. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not outsiders coming in and saying, oh, this is what it means to be spiritual, or this is what it means to be emotionally confident. It's, mm -hmm. it's within the community themselves and so the solutions are coming from the very communities that, that we're, you know, we're trying to support and they become facilitators. So just like yoga teacher training, um, you go and you become a yoga teacher, you take this training, you learn meditation, you learn pranayama, you learn the physical aspects of asana, and then you get your certificate and you go out into your community and you teach yoga. So this is what these facilitators are doing. They're, they are learning this curric this very broad curricula, and then they go back as facilitators into their communities and they teach empowerment and self-defense. Uh, they, they actually facilitate empowerment and self-defense gatherings within their own indigenous communities. Um, and 
We hope to have a facilitator, a house them and facilitator in every single tribe and first nation in the U S and Canada. Um, and that would be 1200, approximately 1200 indigenous women. So what exactly is the House of Moons design? So, yeah, these are just some bullet points of why why we think it's going to work and why why the pilot worked. It's basically because we've we've been asking what's needed and not telling. Um, it's deli delivered by indigenous women for native communities. So, again, nothing outsider there. They get to use their own strengths, their own passions, their own unique cultural perspectives. Because you have to understand, too, that every single tribe in First Nation and has its own culture. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, we're, you know, we, we mistake that everybody who's an Indian is the same. And um, that's, that's not the way that it is. And that's just a sign of our ignorance in terms of how it's been perceived. Um, every culture has its own dress, has its own spiritual practices, has its own ways and teachings and creation stories, and has its own unique set of issues depending on, depending on how the government infiltrated their territories. You know, very few are still on their original lands, but some are. Um, some have been, there have been complete genocides and they're, they're, they don't exist anymore, that particular tribe or First Nation. So everything is unique. And so these facilitators learn this curricula and then they translate it into their own cultural, from coming from their own cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that's what makes it so great because it's it's a, really a sovereign. It's the way that it's set up is based on sovereignty, you know, and they get to create and design their own presentations and not just be teaching something that was taught to them exactly the way that 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 was. And uh, and so also it's self-sustaining because throughout through the organization, we want to compensate these facilitators to go out and do these classes financially, because you cannot be empowered without being able to put food on your table. Yeah. So what are you not? Yes, we're not a Band-Aid. We're not a mission to save. This is a really complex, com one of the most complex issues I've ever been exposed to there will, you know, there's no saving here. There's, there's many things that needs to happen on many, many different levels. This is one entry point and um, we're not excluding people who want to help. We want this to be cross-cultural. We want this to be uh, allies taking up support to support indigenous communities uh, we cannot expect indigenous communities to handle all this on their own, given the level of, of challenge that this is and the reasons behind it are not in their hands solely. So we as non-indigenous people, myself, like myself, I have to find where how I have to make the connection how it's my responsibility too, mm -hmm. to stop this issue. So, um, and then another, the, one of the biggest is just that we're not waiting for corporations to change. We're not waiting for the governments to make the change. It's grassroots. So what are some of the program's accomplishments then? So we ran our first pilot. It just ended. Seven women graduated on April 27th to become our first facilitators. The accomplishments is that it was a cross-border coalition, so these women were not from a single tribe or First Nation. They were from multiple tribes and First Nations in, in the United States and Canada. So in that realm, it's never been done before. Mm -hmm. And um, and we had a 100% graduation rate. So the women that entered the program graduated from the program. And um, that's, I mean, do you... 
I don't know. I look around, I don't see hundred percent graduation rates. And yeah. So that's pretty amazing. And yes, it was a small group, but it doesn't matter. You know, that, that was a huge success. And, uh, I think if you want to go to the next slide, I might have a, a visual. Mm -hmm. class. Okay. So, so this tree really cool was done by a 14 year old from Baltimore. Her name's CC Kolpinski. And she got inspired by the success of the, of the pilot program to create this, this image. And so I had just given her the information of what it was, like what was going on. And this is what she came up with. So uh, the blossoms on the tree, uh, they represent three, there are 307 blossoms. And that was the number of community members that attended the seven graduate, the, the facilitators trainings that they had to do in their communities before they graduated. So that's you amazing. That the number of people that that reached and um, the branches uh, I'm just going from top to bottom. The branches were the number of women who took the training and uh, the fireflies hard to see. I don't know if you all can, it, there, it's a little small on the screen, but there are these little bright little fireflies uh, um, in front of the purple background. And those were the number of contributors, advisors, teachers and council members that helped to bring this to be. And um, the roots, again, difficult to see, but there, there are, it's basically the roots are the, the values of the training. So um, conscious reconciliation is one of the roots and reverence for life givers um, reverence for, for indigenous women then there, and there's more, but so this is what it was rooted in. And so she was inspired to create this. I just think it's awesome. Yeah. And it's a really beautiful representation of how everything kind of is all culminated together. It's all connecting. Yes. And also just to think about when we run our next training, you know, which will have 14 indigenous women, you know, she, I don't know. I don't know. She'll have to do a whole yeah. freeze. <laughs> so on our next slide, it is blank currently, but unfortunately the platform that we are using will not play the video. However, um, Aaron will kind of introduce what this video is about. And should anyone want to see this presentation or see the video, I am more than happy to share these presentation slides with you so you can watch it as well. Yeah. So the video um, you can see on the House of the Moon homepage, and it's, it is a less than a one minute clip. I really wish you could see it, but please try to try to go and look at it. It is the mother of one of the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and her name is Henny Scott. And her mother, Paula, talks about House of the Moon. It talks about, she talks about how it's going to keep the memory of her daughter and other young women that have gone missing and murdered in her community alive and their, keep their memories alive. And, and so it's a really powerful piece and just so you know, this mother has started her own search and rescue crew um, because and, and you'll see that in the film a little bit this because she, because they weren't they weren't getting any help from the local law enforcement. And so they had to they they didn't want families to not be able to reach out to anybody whenever they had a daughter going missing or murdered. And so they have their own search and rescue crew. But yes, go to the homepage. I thank you, Victoria, for putting that up, that website in the chat. So what are some ways that we would be able to get involved? Yes. So I think, you know, if this is the first time you're hearing about it. Let other people know. Pay attention to headlines. Sometimes national media is not good at the mainstream media is not good at covering this topic, but you can go to other news sources like nativenewsonline.net and other sources for for information about this issue. Um, so spreading the wor word, being informed, um, 
we have uh, our next training is 14 women. They can be sponsored to take the training. And so you can be part, you can do a full sponsorship for a woman or a partial sponsorship or get together with a group of other women or a group of other organizations and say, let's sponsor a woman to do this training. Um, so that's another way. And then, of course, you can always reach out to me directly, phone or email, text and for any questions or or any way that you think that you'd like to discuss this further. So with that, if anyone has any questions for Aaron, please feel free to leave your question or comments um, here in our chat. The floor is now open. And I will give some people some time to do so and just letting everyone know um, all of our contact information can be found in the beginning of this episode on the previous slide. Um, this episode is recorded, so it will be available on the replay in Webinar Ninja on DTC's YouTube channel. I will be sending the link to Erin as well, should she feel um, free to post it. And it will also be on dtctodays.com, our website, um, under the webinar section. So if anyone has a question, um, I will go ahead and ask mine. Where do you see the future of House and Moon going from here? Um, are there any solutions that are currently in the works of being implemented? Um, thank you. Yeah. So I think that because we ran a pilot and as, as we know, pilots are meant to be a practice run. They're mm -hmm. meant to figure out what have we what have we missed? What did we get right? What can we do better? And so the fact that we did run a pilot uh, and it was successful given in what I've shared with you and there are mm -hmm. other factors that made it successful. And we learned, we had a lot of lessons learned from the pilot. So we, we definitely made mistakes and to be able to convert those mistakes or quote unquote, not no, nothing's a mistake. It's just something for, for us to learn and grow with the fact that we can convert those into the next version and make it even more powerful than that, I think is moving the program forward. So if we run the next program for 14 women and it's, and it's a success as the pilot was, which we assume that it will be. Mm -hmm. And, um, then, we're going to be able to hopefully get enough attention on this that we'll have a funding source that will let us kind of re relax on that side of things so that we can really move forward with solutions and additional solutions and really getting more and more women into the training, having, you know, being able to run trainings that are on the East Coast and Mountain Time and West Coast. Alaska natives, Hawaiian mm -hmm. natives, you know, things like that. So we can really spread it. Yeah, that would be absolutely amazing. And I hope all of that goes well. I'm excited for these other 14 women to go through the program. Um, I'm sure the seven women that did it, I personally have seen their certificates that they get and they're gorgeous. I hope that they loved everything and that all of these nations and their communities that they were able to bring that information back to, um, that it really stuck and hoping that all goes well with that. I guess my next question would be for non-Indigenous people, we've kind of briefly touched on it, but what are some respectful ways that we would be able to engage to become a good ally? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things you can do. One of them is to read works and books, poetry, novels, mm -hmm. and, and um, historical representations from, by indigenous people. And so, you, you know, when you're, so when you enter into something, you kind of are getting a, a framework uh, to work with. And there's a lot of authors out there, Vine Deloria, who, who really writes a lot about tribal law and federal law as it pertains to indigenous peoples and treaty rights and things like that. These are some of the things that we have to really inform ourselves of as citizens because 
because it's part of our history. And it's just something that we need to know, like we know about the Civil War, like we know about civil rights, like we know um, about other other points in our history. And so that I think that's really important that we shouldn't be ignorant of that. And then also there's a lot of organizations um, on Instagram and, and social media now that cover this topic. So if you do a search for MMIWG, you know, and also I have things listed on the website of houseofthemoon.org and Nation Unsevered, they, they are listed there and so that you can really follow what's happening there. Um, and, and the New York Times actually has covered this issue quite a bit. They've done several reports. So you can always Google that and read a few articles to, to mm-hmm. better, so you better are, you're better informed. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. So now if nobody else has any other questions, we'll go ahead and end it. Erin, thank you so unbelievably much for sitting on this webinar with us, especially for our first Did You Know section. I hope that this was absolutely insightful to everybody that has tuned in during the webinar and will tune in after the webinar. I know personally it was very insightful for me and just having a background conversation with you about all of the inner workings of House of the Moon and everything that anybody working with House of the Moon covers, it's absolutely touching. And I look forward to hearing more about the work that you do. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you for being so supportive. And thank you to DTC for having me on. And also just a huge shout out to you for for being the graphic designer and you and your team, Victoria and, uh, and Steve, the owner, just kind of getting involved with this issue and being so supportive. And um, you designed our graduation certificates for us and you helped so much with our Eventbrite uh, planning just in terms of getting the community members to show up to the, the Zoom trainings in the indigenous communities. And these are, these are things that we don't have funding for yet and we don't have a graphic designer. We don't have social media um, person yet to manage that. And you, you and you and Heather and Victoria have been so amazing um, to, to help us get this forward. We couldn't have come this far without you. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I know that my team absolutely does as well. All right. So thank you everyone for joining us on the broadcast and for watching this afterwards. Again, Erin, thank you so dearly much and hope everyone has a great Wednesday. Yes. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.